Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Give us a call, 208-991-4783, and become one of our friends over on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, this episode is brought to you by the support of our listeners, uh, and uh, I do want to uh, say a special uh, thank you to Lorena, who sent along a donation, and we'll be sending along access to our premium site. Uh, this actually marks the start of our second uh, twice-annual listener support campaign. We did the first one back in August, and we've received uh, some additional uh, donations quite a bit. I appreciate all the support we've received. And uh, basically, the goal of the listener support campaign is to kind of uh, help out with some of the revenue um, in the absence of uh, sponsors. Uh, podcast advertising, like a lot of Internet advertising, has kind of uh, suffered uh, during this uh, current economic downturn. And so we don't have a, uh actual sponsor for our program. And our goal with the listener support campaign is to build towards a long-term goal I have of being able to focus my life and my energy on those things I'm passionate about, including old-time radio, uh, as well as my writing. I've set ideas for other podcasts I'd like to do, but I don't have the time or the energy to do them right. So this is part of that uh, long-term goal. During the, of course, all year round, we anybody who sends us any donation uh, for $7 or more, we'll send along access to our premium site. Well, during this time period, uh, when we're running the listener support campaign, uh, we give away a, a few extra goodies for those who give $20 or more. Uh, for a donation of $20 or more, uh, y- you can get a your choice of a digital download of several uh, modern colonial radio theater productions. Uh, among those available are Perry Mason in the Case of the Velvet Claws, the Father Brown Mysteries, Zorro and the Pirate Raiders, King Solomon's Mine, and Treasure Island. And there's a whole list of other options that are available. This year, uh, for the, this one, we're adding um, uh, two Twilight Zone uh, radio episodes. Uh, there was a Twilight Zone radio series that adapted some television episodes as well as some new ones with some fairly recognizable Hollywood stars. Uh, and uh, it was syndicated, uh, and uh, episodes are available for purchase, and we'll send you digital downloads of uh, any four of the, or any two of the 114 episodes for any donation of uh, $20 or more. Among the episodes available are To Serve Man, Four O'Clock, The Obsolete Man, and Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. Or if you don't have a preference, I'd be happy just to send you two uh, random Twilight Zone episodes. Uh, We're going to be doing Poirot, old-time radio, in a couple weeks. I've been asked to do the BBC uh, programs. Of course, we can't do those but because they're under copyright. But we are offering the Poirot uh, radio episodes, your choice of any of the mysteries. Uh, My favorite uh, is uh, Five Little Pigs. Uh, You can also get Elephant uh, Elephants Can Remember, Murder on the Orient Express, or any of the other ones that have been uh, produced. Uh, And we also, at the $100 uh, level, we offer all five Perry Mason audio dramas from Colonial Radio Theater. Uh, These dramatize the first five Mason novels, Perry Mason, The Case of the Velvet Claws, Perry Mason and the Case of the Sulky Girl, uh, Perry Mason and the Case of the Howling Dog, and Perry Mason and the Case of of the Curious Bride. Uh, more information is available on all the options there. Go to support.greatdetectives.net. Now it's time for today's episode of Barry Craig Confidential Investigator. This one was called The Corpse Who Was Wrong. William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. <laughs> Murderers really have a hard time. In other fields, if a man's work is properly appreciated, he gets higher pay. All a murderer gets is higher voltage. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, 
Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. Barry Craig speaking. It all began quietly enough. He walked into my office, stared contemptuously at the rug, sourly at the furniture, and coldly at me. He said, Good afternoon, Mr. Craig. I am W. Stubbins. How do you do? I am an attorney. I represent Arthur Philip Peterson. You do, huh? You are questioning my word? I was just being friendly. That is not necessary. Oh, forgive me. Cha. Is that annoyance or Russian soup? I find your levity irksome, Mr. Craig. There's no extra charge, Mr. Stubbin. Were it not for Mr. Peterson's insistence upon hiring you... That's uh, Arthur Philip Peterson? Uh, never mind that, Chuck. You might tell me about the case instead of trying to impress me with Mr. Peterson's importance. I, uh, shall. Good. I have here a photograph. Thanks. Of Mrs. Peterson. Stella Peterson, to be precise. Now I have the photograph. Also, on this paper... Uh-huh. ...the address of the lodgings where Mrs. Peterson was last known to be, plus her last place of employment. I'm to assume that she no longer lives or works at these addresses? That is correct. And I am to locate her? If possible. How long has it been since she dropped out of sight? Oh, three months or so. Somebody wasn't in a hurry. There were circumstances. Oh, I'm sure there were. The... Photographs nice and clear. But, I have uh, also here a physical description of the uh, lady. Age, coloring, height, weight, and so on. Well, that might help, but it isn't exactly what I had in mind. Hmm, says here she was 24. How old is Peterson? 61. Well, now we know a lot more. How well do you know, Mrs. Peterson? I barely know her at all. Well, in that case, I'll have to see Mr. Peterson. Descriptions are fine, but in a missing persons case like this, you need more. Habits, tastes, so on, uh, you know, they all help. Seeing Mr. Peterson would do you no good. Well, why? Is he bashful? No. He's dead. With which remark, W. Stubbins decided I had enough information, rose, deposited a check for $500 on my desk, and left. I wondered what the W stood for. <laughs> The address of Stella Peterson's last known lodging was 1217 West 29th Street. The neighborhood wasn't nice. Unless the photograph was telling lies about Stella's appearance, it wasn't the right neighborhood for her. As a matter of fact, it wasn't the right neighborhood for anyone. Yeah. Uh, you're Mrs. Cole, the janitor? Superintendent. Sorry. I've been checking the mailboxes in the hall. Uh, Stella Peterson's name isn't on any of them. Why should it be? Oh, she lives here, doesn't she? No. Oh, uh, she must have moved then. Not from here, she didn't. Not from here. Mrs. Cole, are you trying to tell me Stella Peterson never lived here? I told you. Oh. She uh, may have been using a different name. If you take a look at this photograph, you might recognize her. What would a girl like that be doing in a house like this? Well, uh, that's one of the things I wanted to ask her. Uh, don't bother dropping around with the answer when you find out. You don't recognize her? No. Well, tell me, how long have you been superintendent here? Ten years. Thank you, Mrs. Cole. Don't mention it. One thing puzzles me, though. Yeah? You recognize her name immediately. Didn't ask to have it repeated. That's so. I'm still puzzled. You oughtn't be, mister. What makes you think you're the first one who's been here asking for her? The interview was definitely at an end. Mrs. Cole shut the door in my face. I had no regrets about leaving that house. It was a process that only the dead wouldn't have enjoyed. I climbed into my car and went away. I wondered how big a liar Mrs. Cole was. It took ten minutes for me to be sure I was being followed by someone in a green car. 
I decided it was too early in the case to get drastic about it. I let him follow. Stella Peterson's last known place of employment was in the low 50s. It was also something they called itself the 1020 Club. I had the feeling that the only qualifications for joining consisted of being alive and foolish. Hey, you're a little early, pal. If you was a bird, you'd get the worm. And if I were a worm, the bird would get me. I'm looking for Stella Peterson. It so happens I ain't got her on me. Maybe I left her in my other suit. Does the name mean anything to you? It's a girl's name. Well, she may have worked here under another name. Take a look at her picture. Oh, let's you and me both go look for her. Then we'll toss a coin. Why and... don't you uh, save it for the customer? No sense of humor. Recognize this? That there is a beautiful shade of green. I like the way they engrave those twenties in the corner. Uh, let me have a closer look, huh? Thanks. Huh. Where do I go to find Stella Peterson? You tried the lost and found department at Grand Central? Hey! You want to be careful snatching a bill like that. You could tear it. I'll be careful. You're not letting me keep it? It's not a sample. Well, like the guy said, easy come, easy go. Which guy? I never heard of him. Well, it's been fun. The last customer offered me 50. He did? Yeah. But I like you better. Why? He only let me look at it. All you come up with was a 20, but at least you let me touch it. So long, pal. The nice thing about being a confidential investigator is you get to meet such lovely people. Even policemen. Well, Lieutenant Rogers. Hello, Barry. Buying me dinner or are you working? Well, maybe we can combine the best features of both, Trav. Name one good feature of working. Well, you get paid for it. <laughs> I keep forgetting that. Working with the department, it's easy to do. Wouldn't your boss object to your eating on his time? He's dead. I guess he wouldn't object. He must be a lively corpse if he's going around hiring investigators. The name's Arthur Philip Peterson. Oh, very impressive. What's he hired you to investigate? Well, I've got a picture here. See? Hmm. Didn't anyone ever tell him he couldn't take that with him? He's not really trying. He died sometime last week. Hart. That's his wife. She left him more than three months ago. Uh-huh. What information do you want stolen from the department? Anything the department has on her. If it has anything. We'll see. What's the front name? Stella. I'll feed her to the gallery, boys. What else? A green car keeps driving around behind me. License number 1W17660. You want us to discourage him? No, I'd feel lonely without him. I'd like his name, though, in case we ever meet socially. 1W17660. I've got a couple of hours' work here, Barry. After that, I'll be your guest. Fine. I'll go back to the office. You can call me there. Uh, maybe we'll eat at Willie's Wagon. No, thanks. I've still got scars from the last hamburger I tried to eat there. Well, you can't say the meat isn't fresh. But does it have to be alive? <laughs> In a couple of hours, then. All right. Keep out of trouble. I intend to be very hungry. I headed back for the office. The green car was still behind me. I couldn't make up my mind whether or not to worry about it. I decided to postpone the decision. But I didn't use the front entrance to the building. The back door and the stairs up would be smarter under the circumstances. Every once in a while, I do the smart thing. It always leads to trouble. No. Huh? Don't put the light on. Why not? I'll shoot you if you do. How good a shot are you? Pretty good. You're a big man. I'm not very far away from you. Meaning anybody who could hit the side of a barn door? All right. I'm willing to discuss the matter. I'm not going to discuss the matter. Get away from the light switch. Want me to leave? No. Go to your desk. What am I supposed to use instead of vision? Radar? 
If your eyes must be getting accustomed to the dark. Just walk straight forward. Straight forward. Women and cats are much better at this kind of thing. No! Oh! That was a chair you ran into. Thanks for telling me. I tried to warn you. If you really cared, you'd let me put the light on. No. Sit down. You mean I happen to be directly above a chair right now? The one you knocked over. Pick it up. Oh, okay. If I knew exactly where you were, I could throw this chair at you. That wouldn't be nice. It might be. The only trouble is, I don't know you well enough yet to decide whether you deserve being thrown chairs at. Well, thanks for asking me to sit. Mr. Craig. Yeah? Why are you looking for Stella Peterson? What makes you think I am? But you are, aren't you? One of the things you want to look for if you ever hire a confidential investigator is whether he knows how to keep his mouth shut. About confidential things? Well, yes. Your looking for Stella Peterson isn't a secret. It hasn't made the front page of the Times, either. You've been asking people about her? When I went down to lunch today, I asked the boy at the newsstand who won the 6th at Jamaica. I'm not investigating a racehorse. That's not the same. No, it isn't. But there's nothing you can do about it. Look, I... Why not try telling me why you're so interested in anyone looking for Stella Peterson? I'm interested because... Yeah? Because I'm Stella Peterson. By this time, my eyes had adjusted a little better to the absence of light. I could see her, but not well enough to tell whether or not she was lying. If you want to stop a search, the best way is to indicate that the object searched for has already been found. I wasn't satisfied. You may be Stella Peterson. Don't you think I know who I am? But I don't. Well, I am Stella Peterson. Repeating a lie doesn't make it into a truth. I'm not lying. I didn't say you were. I'm not saying you're telling the truth, either. One way or another, I have no way of telling. But why should anyone imitate me? Why should you be afraid of letting me look at you in the light? It's too dangerous. Someone outside should see the light go on here. Sooner or later, it'll have to go on. But not when I'm here. Okay. Good night. But you haven't told me why you've been looking for me. I haven't told you that I am looking for Stella Peterson, either. I... Shh. Well, it's a trail. Someone's out there. Yeah. Outside the door. What are you doing? Moving up to the door. On one side of it. <gasps> door isn't locked. We're going to have company. Don't use that gun of yours. So glad you can come. Hey, let go. Never what come visiting with a gun in your hand. Okay, I'll drop it. You're breaking my arm. Oh, Thanks. Now, get over to the side. All the way over. Wise guy. Oh, nice. The gun. Yeah. And I think the lights. Where the... Hmm. The door to the next office. Jimmy open. That's how she got in here. How who got in here? You don't see anyone here now, do you? She could have got out through that door to the next office. Who could have? The one who got in. And who was that? Well, that's what I asked you. We're back at the beginning again, huh? Yeah, it uh, looks that way, don't it? <laughs> All right. So far as you're concerned, it began with your walking in here, carrying a gun in your hand. Why the gun? I thought the joint was being burgled. I am a public-spirited citizen. And you happen to be strolling past the office, up on the fourth floor of an office building, late in the evening? Yeah, that's right. It ain't so drafty up here like down on the street. Not a safe, either. You're not going to try any rough stuff, are you? A police lieutenant named Rogers is going to be along in about a half an hour. I already got all my tickets to the policeman's ball. Maybe, but uh, what he'll give you is a burglary charge. Burglary? Yeah, yeah, breaking and entering. Plus attempted armed robbery. Add it up for yourself. Add it up? That could be ten years. Easily. Oh, now wait. I didn't burglary. My word's a lot better than yours. It ain't enough. Maybe you're right. Hmm. See that pen on my desk? Yeah. Pick it up and put it in your pocket. Well, what do you... Hey, wait. That'll prove that I robbed you. Nothing doing. Would you rather I shot you as you were breaking and entering? But you didn't. But I will. Pick up the pen. No. What do you want from me? What's your name? Empty. Who hired you? Uh-uh. 
You prefer ten years up the river? Meaning you're more afraid of wherever it is. I, I'd better get out of here. Hey, come back here. Uh, he knew I wouldn't use the gun on him. Barry Craig here. Uh, Barry. I won't be able to make that dinner date. Why not? A homicide was just phoned in. A woman named Cole over on... Uh... On 29th Street? Yeah. Hey, how did you... 1217 know? West 29th Street? She was the janitor? Uh, excuse me, the superintendent there? That's right. I'll meet you there. All right. Uh, by the way, before I forget, we uh, checked the license on the green car that was trailing you. Yeah? It belonged to a woman named Stella Peterson. So long. I didn't waste any time standing around and looking surprised. The green car was registered in Stella Peterson's name. That might be important later on. Right now, a woman named Mrs. Cole was more important. She was dead. But I thought she might have something to say to me anyway. Hey, uh, Lieutenant. Oh, hello, Barry. Uh, how was she, uh... Strangled? Not pretty, but quiet. Yeah. Body was discovered fast by accident. Grocery boy walked in, found her. Uh, break, maybe. Not for Mrs. Cole... I wasn't thinking of Mrs. Cole. Could I have a look at her, Trav? Yeah, sure. As soon as I brush a few photographers aside. Come on. I don't know why you want to look, though. I expect her to tell me something. Our boy's out of the way. There she is. Yeah. I don't hear her talking. She's telling me plenty, though. Like what? Look at her wrists. Hmm. Interesting. You hadn't got around to noticing details like that yet. I expected them. Burns on her wrist and forearm. Yeah. Kind that would result if you pressed lighted cigarette ends there. She was tortured before she died. That's right. I'm leaving, Trav. Uh, Barry, you know more about this than well, me. Well, it's not a police job. It can't be. You'd only slow things up. There isn't time enough for that. You sure? I have to play it the way I see it. Okay, Barry. Luck. Thanks. The thing was forming into a pattern. I didn't feel bright realizing it because the pattern was backwards. And I was a step behind, as I'd been since the beginning of the case. Maybe a fatal step. <laughs> The 1020 Club was open to business. I went around to the back. The green car wasn't anywhere. So I went inside. Hold it, huh? Hey, it's the pal with the 20 bucks. You still got it? What's your name? Wendell. Is that the name that wins the 20? Mrs. Cole is dead, Wendell. Mrs. Cole? Well, this conversation is getting out of hand. Who's Mrs. Cole? Janitor over on 29th Street. The house Stella Peterson stayed in for a while before ducking for cover. Yeah, well, janitors don't lead healthy lives. Lots of them die. Of strangulation? Well, maybe she was cheating on her husband or not emptying the ash cans right of... She was tortured before she died. Tortured? Yeah. The way I figure, whoever tortured her got what he was after. How do you figure that? He wouldn't have killed her otherwise. She was a lead. Maybe the only real lead he had. That could be. Where's Stella? Out on the island. A beach shack. Phone? No. Neighbors? Not for miles. Come on. We're in a hurry. A big hurry. We made time. I didn't break too many traffic laws. Only one. The one that keeps your speed down. We were lucky. We didn't pick up any traffic cops on the way. Or were we lucky? How much further? Oh, maybe another ten minutes at this rate. You carry a gun? No. And don't try being a hero when we get there. You ain't expecting anything good, are you? No.
Who does the shack belong to? Mrs. Cole. That's why... Uh... Anybody besides you and Mrs. Cole know Stella are staying there? I don't think so. But that was before they got to work on Mrs... Forget it. For now. Stella dropped in at my office. Huh? She had some idea of forcing me to tell her who'd hired me and why. Once she found out I was looking for her. I know. Sure. You were driving the green car. The one that was tailing me. Yeah. Stella took it to drive out to the shack? Yeah, after she ducked out of your place. Too bad you didn't know about Mrs. Cole then. Yeah, too bad. Better slow down. Shack is off a private road. Turning's right ahead. Okay. You've run out of road another hundred feet. Uh-huh. All right, now. Come on. This time of year, the beach is deserted. That's why Stella figured it was safe. It was for a while. That the shack? Yeah. The light's on. Odds are against her being alone. Wendell... Maybe you better get back to the car and... Oh, no, I'm in this with you. Okay. Stella's a good kid. She must be. You get this kind of loyalty. Although, uh... Would the fact she's inheriting Peterson's dough make a difference? She's inheriting... But the old man said he was going to cut her out of his will. That was when she left him? Yeah. He said if she did... He changed his mind. The window. Yeah. Stella and Empey. The guy? Yeah. He must have picked up another gun someplace. He may be jumpy. We'll have to handle this carefully. Is there a back door? Yeah. Leads to the kitchen. You can see the kitchen door from here. Now, give me a count of 30. Then knock at the front door. Count of 30. Okay. Think it'll work? It'll have to. Ten, and I made the back door. Five, and I had it open. Crossing the kitchen without knocking over the pots and pans took eight. That gave me seven seconds. I used them in getting the door to the living room open a crack, and then I waited. Wendell knocked on cue, and... I moved fast. Empia turned to the door. He heard me coming, but before he could get around, I... Uh, Mr. Crane! Yeah. That's Wendell at the door. Open it for him, huh? Yeah, yeah, all right. That was when I heard the sound of the car. I didn't hang around. I ducked into the kitchen. Hi, Stella. Wendell. Mr. Craig knocked the man out, the one who... Mr. Craig? What happened to him? I don't know. He was just here. He must have gone out the back way. Oh, I, uh, I better get this boy's pop gun. He's coming, too. I got it. He'll be all right. He'll be fine. Mr. Stubbins. Mr. Stubbins. Drop the gun, you. Me? Yes. Oh, I, I didn't know you meant me. Yeah, better. MP? Oh. He don't feel good. The idiot. How he ever let you get the best of him, I... Well, never mind. Mr. Stubbins, what are you going to do? What do you think? But why? What have I done to you? It wasn't you, my dear. It was that blithering husband of yours. I don't understand. You left him justifiably enough. He was turning into a senile idiot. You left him and he threatened to disinherit you. You ignored his threat. For which my compliments. Thanks, but I... Of course, he tried to get you back. We did discover your address, the place you work, but I made no great effort. I was waiting for Peterson to carry out his threat. But why did you care? He planned to leave his money to various charities, of which I would be sole administrator. I, uh, <clears throat> I counted on that. As a matter of fact, I rather anticipated the event. I, uh, borrowed some of the money. And then the, uh idiot decided he admired you for your courage in leaving him. Oh, 
And, then... and he did not disinherit you after all. I faced jail, my dear. I kept hoping until the last moment, but then he died, leaving you his money. And if I die too? The money will revert to the estate. I can uh, arrange matters to my satisfaction there. That is why I persuaded Mrs. Cole to give me this address. Why I sent Empey on ahead to hold you. And why I shall now... Oh, no! Sorry, my dear, but it's oh, yes. Oh, oh! Wonderful kitchen you've got back there. Mr. Stubbins is all right. He'll live to die. There's not much explanation needed, so if you don't mind, I'll get it over with quick. With Peterson's death, Stubbins had to move fast. But he didn't dare move without confusing the trail. That's why he hired me. If I could find out, fine. If I failed, there was always Mrs. Cole and torture. In either case, the trail would be confused. Why didn't it work? Why did I expect him to be the killer? Because he was the only one who could have sent Empey to my office. Darling. Oh, I owe you everything. Not really everything. Well, enough so that I want to give you this. Hmm... This is why I wanted to get the explanation over with quick. You've been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, The Corpse Who Was Wrong was written by Lou Vittis. Next week, it's the strange story titled The Corpse Who Stayed for Breakfast, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week's story deals with at least two corpses, a house on the river, a midnight swim accompanied by bullets, and, uh, oh yes, uh, the corpse who came to breakfast didn't eat a thing. Good night, folks. See you next week. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company has just brought you William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Featured in the role of Mrs. Cole was Bryna Rayburn. Don Pardo speaking. Sure, and I'm here to tell you a little about our twice-weekly radio program on most of these NBC stations. We're on every Tuesday and Friday evening, you know, and we do our best to crowd each of our 15-minute programs with real entertainment. Why not make it a regular date to listen to our Dinah Shore show every Tuesday and Friday evening on the NBC radio network? It's another exciting dragnet adventure tonight on the NBC radio network. Welcome back. Well, I I think that maybe there was a little difference uh, between something that's understandable and uh, something that's uh, admirable from the husband's perspective. So I'm not certain I buy into that key pop, plot point, but they said that was the conclusion that he reached, that he admired her for it. But sometimes people act a little weird in mysteries. And this may be one of those cases. All right, well, listener, uh, we, I should know that there were five episodes, or excuse me, seven episodes, in between last week's show and this one. Uh, and the ones we've got names for was The Man Who Wanted to Be Guilty, Man Trap, and The Hour of Decision. Well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback. Uh, Val comments, being a UK uh, listener, I'm in the fortunate position of not knowing any of these series before you bring them to me, Adam. I admit I voted for Nero Wolf or, or Candy in the original listener vote based on the sample episodes you broadcast. But I've actually loved this run. 
Loved her, loved Rain Brandt, loved her marvelous voice. I can picture her in a sassy suit, sailing off into the sunset with her handsome copper. Uh, what will you be bringing us next, I wonder? Well, and they will uh, see tomorrow with uh, uh, Christopher London. Thanks for the comment, Val. Um, and Tim, who commented earlier on... Um, uh, Candy Matson's last, uh, uh, Candy's last case, uh, had an additional thought. She said, he said the plot rang a bell with him. Uh, the structure is basically Trent's last case. Uh, the title, the love angle where the detective suspects the one he or she loves, draws all the wrong conclusions except the explanation and her comeuppance with good grace, vows to renounce detect, and, uh, vows to denounce detect, to renounce detecting in favor of love. E.C. Bentley's spoof, uh, charmed Dorothy Sayers and infuriated Raymond Chandler. Bentley is also remembered as the uh, inventor of uh, the Clarahue, the bio biographic four-line poem with bumpy meter, but always a surprising rhyme of the subject's last name. Uh, Candy Matson would never be seen driving a uh, Datsun. She'd cross the Bay Bridge with Rem Wa Wa Rembrandt Watson and look below, scanning the waters for flotsam. Thanks so much for the poem and for the thought. And, uh, you know, you're right. Uh, Trent's last case. And if I had, um, if I had, uh, thought, uh, clearly, um, I, I probably, truth be told, uh, would have, uh, there's, there's a, uh, radio adaptation of Trent's last case available. And, uh, would have probably played that for a 600th episode special. But we'll play it, uh, we'll play it again eventually. Trent's last case, Candy's last case, a very, uh, a very good, uh, note in comparison to end on. And it also makes it interesting because I've read, uh, you know, some listeners complain the ending, you know, is kind of, uh, uh, you know, politically incorrect or something like that or, uh, but, uh, it was a, a classical ending. Borrowed from one of the most uh, popular mystery writers of the time. Um, of course, they weren't going to let Candy be right, wrong on that most important question of who done it. All right. Well, we have a comment from Podcast Alley. Great podcast. All right. Well, that will actually do it for us today. We'll be back uh, tomorrow with our first installment of the Adventures of Christopher London. Remember, uh, to take part in our listener support campaign, support.greatdetectives.net. Give us a call, 208-991-478. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.